What is up, everybody, and welcome to this month's Patreon pick video. And the topic that was chosen is my top 10 guilty pleasure movies, movies that I love, but certainly have plenty of reasons within them for me not to love them. What is Patreon? What are my top 10 guilty pleasures? What are my thoughts on the term guilty pleasure as a whole? Well, before I get into all of that, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Raid. There's a lot of downtime doing what I do, whether you're waiting for videos to render or upload to YouTube, and I like to use that time to challenge my son on a mobile game that we've been playing. It's an RPG that has many options for PvE as well as PvP gameplay, with a collection of over 700 champions to choose from as well as tactical upgrade and battle systems. And if that sounds good to you, there is no better time than now to start playing Raid. Even if you used to play Raid, there have been a ton of updates to it, including the live arena where you can fight other players in real time time or the cursed city where you can clear monthly added stages for valuable rewards including a free mythical champion and raid along with its 5 million monthly users are celebrating its fifth anniversary and to celebrate that they're hooking you up with some awesome rewards and you can get all of this and two epic horses right off of the bat by using my exclusive link or scanning the QR code on screen and using the promo code festival5 so be sure to check out raid during this anniversary promo and snatch up all those cool rewards and thank you to raid for sponsoring today Today's video. So guilty pleasure is a really interesting term when talking about something, especially when you're talking about film. And it's something that's always been there. But here recently, at least from my experience, the term has started to gain a lot of negativity around it. People get very defensive whenever you bring up movies as guilty pleasures and you tend to get lectured about how how can you tell me this is a guilty pleasure when nobody can be right or wrong in their opinion on films? And why are you feeling guilty about the things that you enjoy? Now, me personally, I have always found the term guilty pleasure to be significantly less serious than a lot of the passion here recently would lead you to believe. I don't feel guilty about anything that I actually like or anything that I enjoy, nor do I expect anybody else to do. And I don't really think that's what guilty pleasure, while I understand the very direct interpretation of those two words, I don't think that's exactly what it means. It's just a film or anything that we enjoy that we do know if we kind of want to take a more critical eye to it, it is maybe not the best thing. Like fast food is kind of a guilty pleasure. We know it's garbage for us, but we like it. It's fun. It's delicious. It's cheap, or at least it used to be cheap. So with all that being said, guys, let's kick this thing off with number 10. And I somewhat tried to rank this based off of guilt. <laughs> the higher you go on the list, the more conversation I think is necessary to kind of uh, explain what specifically about these movies that I enjoy and uh, what I see probably most people taking the opposite stance on. So coming in at number 10 for me is a film by Rennie Harlan that is titled Deep Blue Sea. And this is actually the only shark movie besides the original Jaws that I actually enjoy. Uh, unless there's one that I'm forgetting, but I really don't think that I am. I tend to not like shark movies whatsoever, where you have the original classic Jaws that will always be the best of the best, in my opinion. Uh, and is one of those sacred movies that I... I would not want the job of remaking it, so I don't think anybody else wants the job of remaking it. Deep Blue Sea is a significantly more goofy and campy take on a shark attack movie. You have this research facility in the middle of the ocean where they have these tiger sharks that they're genetically modifying their brains to make them super smart, and essentially these sharks come up with a plot to work the humans around like pawns to... Uh, to escape from this confinement and to get into the ocean. And along the way, a lot of people get eight. So you've got Thomas Jane in here. You've got LL Cool J. You've got Samuel Jackson, a couple of other people that you'll recognize. And this is a really fun movie. If you're along for the joke and along for the ride, it's not meant to be taken seriously. It is not a movie that you want to walk in with a whole lot of logic. Uh, you want to uh, just kind of sit down and enjoy the crazy, ridiculous ride that it takes you on. And I think that it is a significantly enjoyable, uh, ridiculous ride. I mean, you've got sharks that are pushing LL Cool J into an oven and you're getting like cooking puns out of him. You got Thomas Jane showing some of that early Punisher promise here where he's the only one that kind of knows how the sharks think. Uh, you've got one of the greatest surprises and deaths in horror movie history that just comes out of absolutely nowhere. I remember being in the theater seeing this and everybody just lost their shit uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but it's somewhat common knowledge at this point which character it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, you've even got Michael Rappaport in here giving a little bit of that that New York snark. So 
It's a really fun movie, but if somebody came to me and said, that thing is way too stupid, I can't get into it, I'm not going to argue. Like, I, I get it. I'm just along for the ride, and I enjoy the stupidity. Coming in at number nine is one of my favorite comedies as a child that I still maintain a lot of my enjoyment for as an adult, and that is Beverly Hills Ninja. Look, when you're going for a Chris Farley comedy, Tommy Boy is the gold standard. Many people like Black Sheep. I'm not really a big fan of that one. I don't know if I'm on an island with that, but Beverly Hills Ninja is always one that kind of feels like this forgotten movie by Chris Farley. Not that he made a ton of them, but... This is one that, as a kid, I always loved. I loved the physical comedy of having a guy with the build of Chris Farley trying to sell him as this, like, silent ninja. And uh, it's, there's this whole thing where there's the great white ninja, and he's supposed to be the one to fulfill that prophecy, but he's Chris Farley, and he does all the things that you expect Chris Farley to do on screen, just be a giant oaf. And so all throughout the movie, he's trying to f live up to this legacy and is so far the opposite of what any sensible ninja actually would do that it's just comedy gold to me. You got Chris Rock in a small role here. Uh, but essentially, he goes to America to help this woman out. She enlists the help of a ninja to protect her from her gangster boyfriend. And unfortunately for her, Chris Farley was the ninja who was on call the night that she comes. So uh, it's uh, it's a really funny movie. But at the same time, you kind of have to be a Chris Farley fan to get the humor like uh, it, it's very similar physical uh, comedy that you have like Kevin James do a lot of times nowadays. It, it's that fat guy brand of humor. And where I think people have gotten away from that, like they've gotten away from so many other things so ridiculously with comedy where now it's we're so sensitive, we can't make fun of fat people anymore. And it's like, well, if Chris Farley or if Kevin James or whoever else is in the role and they're cool with it and they're playing it up and having a good time, why the fuck should we be offended? I'm probably going to rant on comedy at least three or four times more in this video. But nonetheless, Beverly Hills Ninja, it's a dumb as shit movie. It's absolutely hilarious, though. It's a 90s classic to me. To me, it's easily the second best Chris Farley movie. And it still breaks my heart that we only got like three or four movies from him and was taken from us way too early. But if you haven't seen it, I, I think it still packs a nice little punch. Pun intended. Coming in at number eight is the generation spanning tale of one Joe Dirte. Joe Dirt. This is... I think the one, yeah, the one comedy <laughs> led by David Spade that I genuinely love. Of course, he's great as the co-lead in Tommy Boy, but uh, yeah, Joe Dirt was funny. It kind of came out of nowhere. This is a concept that's, you know, it, it's an original character. It's kind of going for that Forrest Gump thing a little bit where you get this really simple character that goes throughout life and touches so many people's lives. And it's kind of like this this big sweeping epic to a certain degree, but just much dumber, <laughs> much dumber than Forrest Gump, which is actually kind of dumb in and of itself. And I've always found this movie to have a lot of heart for as dumb as it is, for as silly as it is, for how much low hanging fruit that it goes for. It's genuinely a sweet movie that has just a lot of good intentions and a lot of good messaging to it. Uh, where a guy as simple as Joe Dirt, just this kid that was left at the Grand Canyon with a permanent mullet that loves Skinner and, <laughs> and Van Halen and stuff, just going throughout his life, most of which he's this homeless bum and all these different people that he just touches their lives and his eternal optimism and positivity just really affects them in a good way. And, you know, by the end of it, you have this mass of people that are essentially his family because he's just made them better people just by knowing him. It's a really sweet movie, which is part of the reason why the sequel was just absolutely garbage. It lost sight of all that. But Joe Dirt, it's a really funny movie. But much like Beverly Hills Ninja, you know, it's a certain brand of humor. It's that 90s, like post SNL style humor. So maybe for some people, if you watch it for the first time today, it's not going to land as well. For me, it's always been funny. I mean, you get Kid Rock in here as the bully, as the antagonist. You got roles like Christopher Walken. Uh, and there's, there's so many different little cameos and, and like Easter eggs from other films. There's a riff on Silence of the Lambs that's great. So this is another one like Beverly Hills Ninja that just it, it maintains how charming and how funny it is decades later as an adult. Coming in at number seven is a movie called Van Helsing. And this is actually a movie that I didn't realize people absolutely hated until I joined the internet. I always thought everybody thought this was a fun movie, so <laughs> much to my surprise, I was on an island with this one. Uh, it's Hugh Jackman playing the titular role of Van Helsing. It's Steven Somers, who was the guy who did the two first two Mummy movies with Brendan Fraser, and then he did, I believe, the first G.I. Joe film. 
not a filmmaker who's acclaimed. Usually his name brings a lot of groans, despite the fact that I've enjoyed most of what he has done. Uh, but, you know, this is a type of film that it's schlocky, it's campy, it's over the top. I feel like by design, but most people that watch it tend to feel like it's just uh, it, it's just, it's all guilt. There's no pleasure here. Uh, it's a movie that's just way too dumb and way too silly and way too hokey and campy for its own good. And, you know, I respectfully disagree. I have fun with this one. I think that Hugh Jackman's fun in the role. Uh, obviously, he can lead a movie very easily, so he's very charismatic. I think that despite her accent being a little bit too thick, which also just kind of leaning on the campiness, uh, Kate Beckinsale, I enjoy in this one, and I enjoy her chemistry with um, Hugh Jackman. I, I like all of the original Universal monsters and the little twists that we get with them here, where you got Frankenstein, you've got the Wolf Man, but he actually like tears the human flesh away, and so there's like a wolf underneath instead of the wolf like sprouting from skin. Uh, even Dracula, he's got like this 50 foot wingspan. He's a gigantic bat instead of turning into a little bat like the old Bela Lugosi stuff. So. I thought it was fun and creative at the time. I re recently revisited this last year when we did the uh, Creatures of the Night edition of 31 on 31. And I think Brian had this as his 31. I think Sean had it significantly low in his list because it was a first time watch for him. I, it was much higher on mine. I have a good time with this one, but I get it. <laughs> I, I get that there's problems. I get this isn't for everybody. I get that it uh, it doesn't take itself seriously enough in the right areas and takes itself too seriously in the wrong areas in certain ways. But I've always found this to have kind of a goofy charm to it that still works for me as an adult. Number six is a little movie called Trick or Treat, not Trick or Treat, Trick or Treat. This is a heavy metal horror film from 1986, if I'm not mistaken. And this is one that I was introduced to as a child by my dad. I've told you stories numerous times, but back in the day, basically my movie library, my movie knowledge and my movie education, if you will, was limited to whatever VHS tapes dad had. And so this is one of them where you have a kid thick in the heavy metal culture of the 80s who idolizes this uh, front man named Sammy Kerr. And he's the the subject of a ton of controversy, kind of like D. Snyder at the time, where uh, you know you had like the PMS or the PMRC, where everything about heavy metal seemed like it was sadomasochistic and uh, sexually abusive and all this crazy stuff. So that type of guy, and he idolizes him, and the guy dies in a hotel fire. But through a, a series of events with uh, <laughs> none other than Gene Simmons as the local uh, DJ. He's able to get a copy of the last unreleased record of Sammy Kerr. And so when he takes it home and he plays the record backwards, he actually is able to talk to Sammy Kerr from beyond the grave. And sinister things start to happen. Uh, this is a really, really niche movie. Like if you're not really into or educated on heavy metal culture, more specifically heavy metal culture of the late 80s, uh, then this movie can go over your head very easily. Like there's a lot of direct commentary here, some subtle, some not so subtle in regards to the PMRC and the controversy surrounding heavy metal or even some of the more uh, cultural things like playing your records backwards, which people used to do. And then they would like start to feel like they would hear things and then they would fuck up their records and have to buy more. There's a line directly in the movie about that. So it's a very niche movie. But for people like me that grew up even though I didn't grow up in the 80s, but grew up very educated and very much indoctrinated into the heavy metal culture. Uh, I've always loved this one. It is my favorite movie soundtrack of all time. The whole movie is, is got a music by Fastway, and it's just it's an awesome time capsule of heavy metal in that era. Uh, I love the character of Sammy Kerr, and I love a lot of the humor in the movie. The special effects are certainly low budget and hokey. Uh, there's a scene where a girl is essentially being seduced by the <laughs> the record and like a little lizard demon comes out. I mean, it's it's got its its elements to it that I could see turning people off or looking at me like, really, that's in your top 50 horror of all time. OK, but uh, it, it, there's a lot of nostalgia here. But it's also a movie that I just feel like touches so directly onto the culture that I've always loved that I've always gotten a lot of enjoyment out of it. And I actually think this would make for a really cool like legacy sequel. I know we're all getting burnt out on legacy sequels, but 
if you could get somebody that loves this movie that's passionate about it, like Corey Taylor, uh, who can also maybe even do the soundtrack. I- I'm pitching this to Corey Taylor right now. So, Corey, I know you're watching. Like, call me. We can make this happen. Get somebody like Corey Taylor who's in the industry and can pull some strings and do a legacy sequel where somebody, now that records and vinyls are starting to become cool again, who gets a hold of that record in modern times and then unleashes 80s metal onto modern times. Like, I would want to write that script. I would want that to happen. But enough pitching my ideas for movies. Number six, Trick or Treat. If you like heavy metal culture of the 80s, definitely check it out. It's a really fun movie. It's a really cool movie. Uh, but it's not for everybody. Number five, 90s Kids Unite. This one is Good Burger, which is one of the only movies that came out of the All That, uh, which is like the kids version of SNL. And, uh, you know, it's odd timing that I had this on the list. And here, just within the last week, we got that documentary, The Quiet on Set, about all of the the real life horrors that surrounded all of the kids that worked on uh, Nickelodeon shows in the nineties and the two thousands. So I guess guilty pleasure has multiple meanings when we're talking about good burger, especially since Dan Schneider is one of the people in the cast playing the manager, but good burger you have, uh, it was a skit that was a very popular recurring skit on all that, where you had Kel Mitchell playing Ed, the the really dim-witted cashier at this fast food restaurant called Good Burger. And this is the movie version of it where you get Kenan Thompson and you know Kenan and Kel were basically like the Abbott and Costello of 90s kids TV. And uh they have this kind of rinky dink little local fast food shop called Good Burger that across the street, this monstrous behemoth conglomerate called um Mondo Burger is opening up. And so it's about fast food rivalries, and there's a lot of really silly situations. It's a kid's movie, so I don't know how you gauge the guilt there because, I mean, obviously most adults wouldn't enjoy this to begin with. And as you grow up to be an adult, a lot of the humor and the appeal to it is probably going to be lost on you. But I still have fun with this one. I introduced my kids to it. They enjoyed it. I was very excited for Good Burger 2 last year, and it, it, it was fine enough. It wasn't nearly as bad as I was fearing it was going to be, but... It wasn't much better than I expected it to be at the same time. So this is certainly a piece of my childhood that uh, I'll always enjoy this. And I'll always enjoy watching some of the the older 90s Nickelodeon stuff. Although now it just has that ultra ickiness to it because of all the real life stories. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. Quiet on set. If you're a 90s kid and you um you watched a lot of 90s Nickelodeon. Get ready to have your childhood ruined when you watch that. Coming in at number four is going to be Rocky Four, And this is a movie that is kind of the quintessential definition of guilty pleasure for me. Uh, This is actually my third favorite, I think. My third favorite movie in the Rocky and Creed universe, uh, followed only by the original Rocky and the original Creed. I absolutely love what this movie does, even though it's kind of the dumbest version of what a Rocky movie could be. Uh, It is ultra 80s it is such a product of its time there's a ton of uh, music video montages to it i mean half the movie is music video montages and that might even be generous just saying half uh the whole plot of the film essentially revolves around rocky and drago kind of being the personification of the u.s versus the uh the soviets for like the cold war and Rocky essentially ends the Cold War by defeating Drago at the end of it and inspiring Russia and U.S. to get along. Uh, It's so dumb. It is absolutely dumb as fuck. I mean, it's one of those movies that, like I said, it is very high on my Rocky ranking. I love it. This is probably the Rocky movie that I watch the most. Uh, But when I hear somebody say this is the worst Rocky movie, I don't flinch. I'm like, yeah, I get it. (laughs) I understand. I know exactly why you're going to tell me why it's the worst. And I don't really have a good argument for you. I just enjoy the hell out of it. And we recently, just a couple years ago, got the director's cut of this, the Rocky versus Drago cut. And I do think it's a better version of the movie. It's still not quite like the, the, the complete fix of the movie because they never shot the movie to be the version that Stallone kind of tried to turn it into with his director's cut, but it gives you more of a hint of a a version of this film that fits a little bit more with the tone of the rest of the franchise, uh, where Rocky three and Rocky four, especially are just very eighties time capsule tonal shifts in the Rocky films. But yeah, this one's a lot of fun. If you're a Rocky fan, most Rocky fans at least like this movie, even if they do think it's objectively the worst, but this right here, 
guilty pleasure. You look it up in the dictionary. There's a big ass picture of Rocky clocking Drago. And this topic was chosen by my patrons over on Patreon. So in every single one of my videos, there's a link to my Patreon page. It's essentially my crowdfunding source. If you guys enjoy what I do, if you enjoy this channel and you want to help contribute to it to allow me to do more things, or if you just want to contribute to it as a thank you, I, I greatly appreciate it. That is the way to do it down below. And there are also a bunch of perks that go along with it, depending on what tiers that you uh, decide to subscribe to. One of them is a Patreon pick. So every single month I put out a uh, poll for all of my patrons to give their ideas for video topics. I choose the top ones that I like, and then a poll decides which one it is. And this month, we've landed on Guilty Pleasures. Coming in at number three is a movie I was only recently introduced to through a review series, and that is Deadly Friend. This is a Wes Craven film, and I watched it for the first time maybe three years ago when I was doing my Wes Craven review series. Had never heard of it before, uh, and only after seeing the movie that I realized that I had seen one scene of it where you have the basketball kill. And I'd seen that picture, that GIF, show up on the internet numerous times without ever knowing what movie that was from. And essentially what you have here is you have this kid that has built this R2-D2 robot type thing to be like his best friend and to uh, to do all of these things that would like seem mind-blowing as far as technology's abilities back in the 80s. And he befriends this girl who moves next door that is played by Kirsty Swanson. And they get a little bit of like a cutesy romance going. And there's this miserable old bitch that lives across the street who is played by Mama Fratelli from the Goonies or the mom from uh, Throw Mama from the Train, if you've seen that one. And through a series of events, essentially, she destroys this robot with a shotgun. And then not too long after that, there is an accident where Kirsty Swanson's character gets killed. And so this kid has the genius idea to take essentially the brain of his robot, BB, and put it inside of this girl, this, this girl that he has fallen in love with that just died tragically, and essentially brings them back to life as one. And the movie was always intended to be a little bit more of like a family friendly sci fi type picture. But because it's Wes Craven, he got massive amounts of pressure from the studio as well as the fan base of things like Nightmare on Elm Street to make it a horror film. So there was if I'm not mistaken, there was a cut of this film that was the direction that Wes Craven wanted to take, which is more along the lines of like short circuit or batteries not included, something like that from the 80s. And test screenings were flocked full of Wes Craven fans, and they all just lambasted it because there was no kills, there was no horror, there was no uh, blood and guts and things. And so the studio essentially mandated for him to reshoot this movie and retool it as a horror film. And so it went from being called Friend to being called Deadly Friend. And uh, what you have is absolutely a movie that I refer to as a disaster piece. This thing is incoherent as fuck. It makes no sense. You can tell there's these weird, drastic tonal shifts where they're trying to go from something very, very sweet and family friendly to a chick's head being exploded by a basketball. Uh, there's just insane amounts of tonal shifts and weirdness and, and campiness and ridiculousness in this movie. But I had a blast with it because of all of that. Like, It's not a popular film. It's not even a film that I would say completely has cult status because I never hear anybody talk about it. But it ended up being one of my favorite of Wes Craven's movies when I was watching through his filmography because it's just so fun to experience this as a so bad that it's good experience. And I actually did a live kind of watch along commentary with my buddy Rudy and he hadn't seen it in years and we were just dying laughing the entire movie. I mean, when you get into the third act and you've got Kirstie Swanson lifting grown ass men above her head and going BB and throwing them, it's fucking hilarious. And the movie ends on a note that makes zero logic sense whatsoever with an actual robot busting out of the skin of Kirstie Swanson as if putting you know, some chips and some wires in her head suddenly grows a full robot exoskeleton. It makes no sense, but it's fucking awesome. I mean, again, this 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 actually might compete with Rocky Four uh, on the dictionary side of just being an absolute guilty pleasure because you cannot have pleasure that isn't somewhat guilty with this movie because it's a mess. 
but it's awesome. Number two is M. Night Shyamalan's The Happening. This is a movie that is very often put towards, if not at the bottom of people's M. Night Shyamalan ranking, although unfortunately he's a director that has numerous movies that could compete for that spot. The Happening is a movie that in advertising stages felt like it was going to be this return to form for him. I remember it being marketed fairly heavily as being like his first rated R movie. So there was actually going to be some gore and some kills. And I remember that bringing a bit of interest to it. And there was a lot of mystery as all M night Shyamalan movies have in the advertising stage where people are just killing themselves for unexplained reasons. You know, people are just dying all around the world in these really weird, gross, macabre and, and mysterious ways. And so the movie obviously was going to be about answering the question of why, what is causing these people to do this? And you go and see it. And this is just uh, just like with Deadly Friend, an absolute so bad that it's good experience in so many ways. I mean, you have Mark Wahlberg here. And God bless him. I'm a fan of old Marky Mark. But this was one of those times where he was either horribly miscast or he was just directed really poorly as an actor. And so you get all of these classic moments of like Mark Wahlbergisms <laughs> with the, the inflection of his voice and the way that he says things. Planning on stealing something? No, ma'am, we're not. Plan on murdering me in my sleep? What? No. There's a classic scene where he's talking to a like a little fake bush for a solid 30 seconds. So that's crazy as hell on one side of it. Uh, you have so many side characters in this movie that are ridiculous, like the hot dog man that just stand out for nothing else than just being weird and having no reason to, to give the dialogue that he gives. Like the, people are dying. It's post-apocalyptic. And he, he waxes away about the value of hot dogs for like a solid two minutes for no reason. And, and it's awesome because of that. And then you get to the ultimate reveal of the film, which spoiler alert. I mean, I'm not ruining anything for you, but uh Plants essentially are killing people. Plants, global warming, they're, they're upset at what we're doing to kill the atmosphere. And so they start releasing like toxins, if you will, if you will, into the air. And so uh, if you're around trees or plants or flowers and you piss them off, they'll make you kill yourself, <laughs> which there's a version of that that could have been really cool. The version that we get from M. Night is absolutely asinine. But when you add all of these things up, it makes such a fun experience to watch if you go into it with the intention of laughing. If you go into this expecting like a really solid thriller or solid horror film, you are going to be massively upset by the end of it. But if you gather some of your more obnoxious friends and you sit down and you kind of prime everybody like this movie's dumb as fuck. So just expect to laugh at everything and we're just going to roast it from beginning to end. And then you press play. You got one hell of a night on your hands because every single scene has something <laughs> that you can just rip to shreds and have a great time with it. So not a good reflection of M. Night Shyamalan's capabilities as a writer or director, but my God, it's one of the best gifts that he has given us as long as you watch it with the right attitude. But my number one guilty pleasure of all time, which is not only probably my favorite of these 10 movies, but also the movie that I think uh, the, the word guilt certainly comes in there quite a bit just because there's so many different elements of this movie that are kind of unexplainable and unjustifiable, but we love it regardless. And that is Sleepaway Camp. To me, this is not only one of my favorite horror films, it's one of my favorite slashers. It is my favorite uh, ca camp counselor slasher. I like it much more than any of the, uh, the Friday the 13th films. And this is also a film that I would call a disaster piece because I think that it's awesome. I think that it is a mainstay in pop culture, at least for horror fans. I think that it's uh, even kind of an important movie to a certain extent for people to experience if you're really into slashers. But I watched this movie and I cannot for the life of me tell you what brilliance in this movie was intended and what was absolutely accidental. And I don't even know if they know. <laughs> like there's so many things about this that are so wrong and so off kilter and are so taboo, especially like this is absolutely one of those movies you could not remake. I mean, there's elements of it that I would love to see somebody try to make, but just remaking this, if they were going to do like a, a shot for shot remake, it, it would never happen. You have a counselor here. You have a cook that is overtly a pedophile. I mean, there's a scene where all these young kids are coming out as it's the first day of camp and he's standing outside smoking a cigarette and he's like, ah, look at all these young spring chickens back where I'm from. 
We call them baldies. And the next, the nearest adult to this guy is not like, what the fuck did you just say? Like, I'm sorry. Did you guys check this guy's references? Like, none of that. He's just like, oh, man, you crazy, boy. You crazy. Makes your mouth water, don't it? Party. They are too young to even understand what's on your mind. You've got the owner or at least the head counselor of this camp who's like a 60 year old man who in the third act, his entire plot arc is trying to fuck one of the 18 or 19 year old counselors, maybe even younger than that. But that is really given no explanation. I mean, it's not even like there's a quid pro quo thing in there. There's not even something set up where the young counselor is trying to like advance their career. It's just like, yeah, they like each other and they're going to go fuck somewhere as long as they get some time. And it's like, I don't know why this is here. <laughs> why? What does this lead to other than more craziness? You get to the end of the film, which I'm not going to spoil, but it is one of the most shocking endings of all time. If you are lucky enough to walk in blind, which most people will not be because it's kind of well known, but that in and of itself is something where it's just my God, the no pun intended, but the balls that it takes to do that. Even going to the more technical aspects of stuff, like the score of this movie and how like how loud and how much it just assaults your ears at certain points where you get like the music that just kicks in and it does it all throughout the movie, uh, especially in the final act of the film. I mean, there's, there's this whole revelation that comes with the third act and the full nature of the, the main character and who the killer is and everything. And it's just so many things throughout this movie. I mean, you could, you could pause every five minutes in this and find something just horribly wrong and taboo or just really technically inept with what is going on. And yet all of it adds up to be this movie that has just become this mainstay cult classic that I absolutely love, that I enjoy. And it's one of the movies that I enjoy introducing people to the most, especially if I can can figure out that they're somebody that doesn't know where things go in the movie. And I just get to put it on and just watch them. That is such a good experience. So yeah, sleep away camp, man. Like again, if you have not seen it, please don't look up anything. Just check it out and you're welcome. And I highly apologize at the same time for what you're about to experience, but sleep away camp. That's my number one. That's, that's my number one guilty pleasure. My favorite on this list. And the one that, whether or not I'm somebody that feels guilty about his pleasures or not, so that there's always a bit of guilt <laughs> with enjoying the sickness of this movie as much as I do. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all my 2024 new release reviews. I'm also going to put my most recent from last month Patreon pick for you to check out the last topic that these guys chose. Be sure to check out Raid down in the video description below. And as always, like, share, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss everything in the future. And as always, remember... Opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.